Andrew, we just finished up our video series on dealing with, that was focused on dealing with uh, government-backed federal loans and the different income contingent plans, IBR, repay, uh, consolidation, all that's great information. But you're also, and probably more now, focused and, and have a great deal more experience that you can help people with in regards to private student loans. So um, thanks for joining me again on our YouTube channel, Debt Bites. And so the viewers know a little bit about your background. Um, again, if you don't mind repeating it for this segment, um, tell, us, tell me a little bit about your experience helping student loan borrowers. Sure. Um, I've been a debt negotiator since 2009. I uh, got into the industry completely on accident after I got laid off from my job at the Palm Beach County Courthouse. Found out that I, I really loved helping people with their debt problems and, and negotiating especially. And I just really kind of evolved with that. Um, I had my own federal loans, I had my own private loans. And I kind of connected the uh, career side with my personal issues with my own private loans and federal loans in 2011 and 2012, right after I got certified through the National Association of Certified Credit Counselors. And I realized that um, you know, there, there was a lot of, of need for people to um, get help with their federal loans and private loans. You know, back in 2012, it was kind of, as you said, before the iceberg really was... Uh, was breaching a lot. There really was not much in the media about student loans. It was kind of a hush-hush thing. Then in 2013, it just kind of exploded in the, in the media as far as stories and coverage and the realization that this is a huge issue. And that was around the time when student loan debt passed uh, the total credit card and unsecured debt. I think that was the big tipping point there. Um, so I, I've been helping borrowers with uh, private student loans since 2013, with settling private student loans since 2013. And helping borrowers with federal loans, excuse me, since 2012. Although I mainly do focus on negotiating private student loans um, right now, there just is not a lot of people that specialize in private student loans. And I, I love negotiating. I love getting a great deal for my clients. And that's kind of the reason why I decided to focus on private student loans. Although, as you mentioned, I still like to be involved in the federal loan space as far as advising people, referring them to legitimate uh, experts, and not student debt relief companies and being involved in part of that broader discussion there. But um, you know, the, the private student loans only make up about 8% of all student loan debt. So proportionally, it's not a lot. But the people that do have private student loans are really, really struggling because there are not a lot of options. Uh, they're just very inflexible compared to federal loans. And Sometimes I was recently, people have uh, both, right? Yeah, I was just going to say I was, I was recently uh, quoted in a, a NerdWallet article, which was syndicated in the USA uh, Today, uh, college section which discussed some of the methods people can use to try to modify or get different terms for their private loans and out of all the methods that they mentioned I mean they're all pretty much low probability options for most people I mean we've tried to get people on to the Navient um, payment modification program for private loans no luck I've submitted several borrowers done sheets and sheets of paperwork not a single one was approved uh, Discover and Wells Fargo both claim to have a similar type of program, but you know it may not be that that broad of a, of a solution for a lot of people because it's it's not something I hear about very often that people have actually gotten onto these payment plans. I'm really not sure how much of that is just a PR effort by the private loan lenders who are experiencing significant pressure from the regulators to do something and to make their loans um, more flexible or at least make the repayment terms more reasonable. Um, you know, I think that private student loans should not be a vehicle for investors to make profit. They should be designed to eventually be, re, you know, paid down or repaid. I talked to a lot of people that have been paying for years and have no progress, or they've paid. Um, for example, a recent borrower I talked to had paid fifteen thousand dollars in the last several years. Her balance increased by fourteen thousand dollars, so it didn't go down at all. It, it increased by fourteen thousand, but she had paid fifteen thousand. So the high interest rates, the hidden fees, um, it really makes people feel like they're trapped and there's no way out of their private student loan debt. And the lenders are not offering a lot of repayment plans at all to help people. I really would like to see some kind of like IBR equivalent established for private student loans, but the lenders would have to pretty much do that themselves unless it was a government-backed program like, like a refinance or something like that. Um, so we, we may not see that happen, but uh, another thing is that private student loans are exempt from bankruptcy in many issues, uh, or in many cases, and um, there are some instances where they can be discharged, and people should definitely explore that. 
but the 2005 BAP CPA law made sure that uh, it was going to be much more difficult for people to discharge those loans. They have to go through an adversary proceeding if they do try to file bankruptcy on their private loans, and they're going to be in for a fight. The lender is going to put up a fight. Um, one of the ways that I assist borrowers with private student loans is negotiating settlements, either lump sum or structured settlements on their private student loans, and that can be one of the fastest and least expensive ways to pay off your private student loan. The caveat is that lenders will not come to the negotiating table unless the loans are in default. And for private loans, that's 180 days from, for most private loan borrowers. So for borrowers who are already behind or in default, it's a great option to consider. For borrowers who are current, they really have to weigh whether sacrificing their credit score for several years is worth reducing their private loan balance by 50% or more. No counselor or advisor should ever tell someone to default to do that. But some borrowers do decide to do that on their own because they have no other options. And in a way, the lenders have kind of forced that on them. They've not given them any other options as far as repayment plans. Sure. So they circle back around to, well, this is the only way I can really get rid of this thing and not be paying on it for the rest of my life. So my litany has all long been um, for, gosh, a couple of decades now is, is that, look, I can't tell you to stop paying your bills. All I can do is inform you of the opportunities and the drawbacks to doing so, right? And so when right. you weigh those, you, you make an informed decision, which is really cool about some of the things that I know you do. Uh, and that whole informed, sincere, let's get you, you know, educated up and figure out what's going to work for you, your lifestyle, your age, moving forward, your credit scores. Are you going to apply for a mortgage in the next two years? Probably not a good idea. Are you going to do this, this, and that? So uh, there is a way to plan around that negotiation element. Now, in this way, um, because of, again, some of the massive size of this student loan iceberg, uh, more of it, more of it being exposed on the private student loan side, I would say, at least in my experience, that I'm seeing more flexibility on the settlement side in the last couple of years because of this heightened awareness than I saw, say, you know, just, you know, 2011 and, and longer. Would you say the same thing? I think it's definitely um, something that loan servicers or the, the private loan lenders are realizing is, um, you know, good for them as well. You know, if they didn't want to do it, then it wouldn't exist. So. Obviously, they're creating the, the, the ways that you know, borrowers can do that, although I have seen that you know, they, they really make it sound like, especially Navient, the largest private loan lender, they make it sound like the, the apocalypse is coming. If you stop paying your bills, you're going to die. Um, horrible things are going to happen. They'll threaten uh, vague legal action. They may send a certified letter, basic collection letter to your, your workplace, to your house. And they do that to play on the idea of a wage garnishment or um, a summons, something that's, that is important that, that lenders can send to your house by certified mail. And Navient will play on that by using a basic, very generic uh, collection letter and send it by certified mail. So there are some things like that to watch out for if you do fall behind on your Navient private loans and with other private loans. It's in their best interest to take a settlement because they know that it's, it's better than not getting anything over time or trying to pursue extensive uh, litigation and maybe they just get a judgment at that point and they have to try to execute the judgment. There's no guarantee they're going to collect on that. Although some private student loan lenders, like the National Collegiate Trust, which is one of the other big ones, they're very, very aggressive. I mean, they'll try to take people to court within, say, 12 to 18 months after non-payment. So if you have a National Collegiate Trust private student loan, you want to work out a settlement with them as soon as you can. But at the same time, they're not going to come to the table for a good settlement percentage until you're significantly into the, the default uh, or the delinquency. So. The key thing with negotiating private student loans that I've found is uh, negotiating when you're far enough behind on the loan where the lender is uh, incentivized to take a settlement, but not so far behind that you're risking legal action. Um, and, and also, I mean, legal action really is the last resort, even if it goes to a collection attorney in your state, which is the only way they can actually try to take you to court. Uh, even if it goes to that type of collection attorney, they're most... Uh, most often they're still going to try to settle with you or they're still going to accept a settlement. They may not propose it, but they will accept a settlement in, in those kind of cases. The most recent one I did was with a Navient private loan. It was with 
a collection attorney in my client's state, so they got a little nervous, understandably. But we were able to negotiate a 40% settlement split up over five years of payments with a down payment as, as the first payment. And the, the thing is, they'll still accept a good settlement at that stage, even though they have a little bit more leverage. Um, we also will encourage someone to find a reputable consumer defense attorney in their state if they are facing imminent legal action. Although I've never personally had a client get sued uh, that's been able to sign on with me prior to them getting summoned to court, uh, sometimes people do find me after they've already been summoned. Maybe the worst case scenario, they get a judgment. The private loan judgments can still be settled in a lot of cases. Yeah. So there are a lot of opportunities to settle in the collection cycle. So we've got a ton of videos up on our YouTube channel here about settling. Most of the focus is dealing with debt buyers that you know purchase up uh, credit card receivables or dealing with banks and, and settling yourself. But it's different, right? So with um, some lenders uh, and some loan amounts of certain size in non-student related, uh, student loan related industry, um, in that space, there's sometimes where you have to do a heavy documentation settlement, right? And so it's not something that I typically DIY and, and educate on. In those areas, it's better to work with a pro. And in the student loan space, you know, sometimes this stuff can be pretty heavily document intense and in where, you know, they're going through financial worksheets, six pages, they want to know highline items about budget, expenses, how you live in, you know, what's, what, what are you paying? Because um, they want to see what your collectability looks like long term. Are you gainfully employed? Right. Can you make payments? Well, if you can afford payments, how, why should they take a haircut and, and get a settlement? So um, I do recommend people reach out and talk to professionals when it comes to settling their private student loans because it's not necessarily going to go down just like a credit card. It is nice that we're seeing more and more payment options on those reductions. Like you talked about Navient taking you know, five years, uh, two years, three years on these um, reduced amounts. That makes it you know, something that people can sign on to. Um, real quickly, what are some of the obstacles that you think people run into more than anything with dealing with private student loans? themselves? Well, as far as negotiating the settlements, um, I think it's probably a similar obstacle that people run into with credit card debt, which is they just don't have the experience that the collector has on the other end of the phone. They don't know whether what the collector is telling them is true or not. I hear about all these arbitrary deadlines. You have until the 30th or the account will be terminated or you know, all these things. And it's just arbitrary deadlines. It goes to another office in the same collection agency the next month or in the lender's office the next month. And being able to, to sort fact from fiction based on previous experience, I think that is a major reason why people look into hiring a professional negotiator. Um, so that's one of the obstacles they run into. And then some of the other obstacles are when it comes time to execute the settlement. And I, I really like to say a lot that uh, executing the settlement is just as important as negotiating the settlement. If you get a great deal but it's not executed properly and you lose it, or you make a payment that goes to your balance, and then you get a call from a collection agency a month later and they have no recollection of the settlement, you don't have the proper documentation of it, then that great deal was really not such a great deal. So you hear about that a lot. I mean, there's a lot of horror stories out there, of people that thought they settled and find out later that they didn't or they don't have the documentation to dispute the settlement or the fact that they got the settlement afterwards. So I like to pride myself in the fact that we have never had an issue like that after getting a settlement because we keep documentation of the payment method used, the settlement confirmation, as well as a settlement letter. And a lot of times filing certain types of complaints are going to help people resolve those issues afterwards because maybe the debt collector, and this is another obstacle, does not take the borrower as seriously if they don't have a professional or an attorney on their side that's representing them. You know, and I want to throw this in there because you made the letter reference, right, and it's like this sense of urgency whether it's on the phone or in the mail, what people don't sometimes appreciate is, is and I know this to be true for, for a fact, um, PhDs work on the color of a collection notice. They work on the font. They work on the placement of verbiage on these letters. They've actually gone so far as to scent these letters and actually a aroma type of experience and what gets be So PhD level people work on these collection efforts and when you're on the phone with a collector a whole lot of very smart people have whittled this down to a training process for the debt collector the more experience they have the better they are at it the newer maybe just a little bit more green 
but you have to appreciate the science I do because I'm a debt geek um, that goes that you're working against sometimes when you have to try and come up against one of these behemoths, one of these navians or what, what, what have you, when you're trying Absolutely. to come up with a solution. So it, it matters um, working with the pro. Now, let me, let me ask you this. Um, we talked about student loan servicers and being able to pick your own, you know, when you're dealing with consolidation on your federal loans. But if you had to pick some, somebody out, I have a suspicion I already know the answer, but um, who's the private student loan servicer that you, you would caution people as to um, taking too much, you know, take what they say with a grain of salt or, you know, don't let them lead you on because of these aggressive practices or how they mislead you down here or talk about how they can't, they're private student loans, right? They're willing to negotiate the balance reduction and somehow they're letting the, uh, the collection fees, you know, that are ginormous um, become part of the dialogue and it's misplaced. Who would you warn people against? Well, obviously, you know, Navient, as we've discussed, okay, um, their, their federal loan practices are, are similar to some of their private loan practices. And I mean, I, I just see them just flat out lying to people in the collection process and threatening people. I just feel like maybe they would do better if they didn't try to scare people so much and, and let them know settlement was an option. They will not even mention settlement until you're way into default, and they're going to threaten you with a lot of other things before that. They'll just casually say, oh, we're going to take your house. Oh, we're going to do this. Well, we don't live in North Korea. They can't just go take your house. You know, We live in a country where you can represent yourself in court and defend yourself or hire an attorney to do that. And not even that, I mean, there's just a very small amount of, of private loans that actually go into legal collections. But it's the favorite threat of, of Navient's internal, or internal recovery and internal uh, debt collectors to say that. And I'm just shocked by how casually they just throw it out there, oh, well, we're going to take your house. And it, it works. It scares people into making a payment or getting on to a payment plan, um, which Navient does have some payment plans when you're in default. The problem is those payment plans keep you perpetually in default. They don't bring you back current. So as far as the short-term option, maybe it makes sense. Maybe it makes more sense to just save for settlement. Uh, as far as a long-term option, who would want to have a charge-off on their credit report for the next seven years or for as long as they're making payments? It's not, uh, it's not really fair to the borrower for whatever credit decisions they have coming up in life. So. Um, yeah, Navient has, has some issues with their collection process. They're extremely aggressive. They try a lot of different things uh, when it's still with Navient Internal Recovery. And in some ways, the third-party debt collectors who become involved anywhere from 6 to 12 months after um, the, the charge-off, they're a little more controlled because they have to be. They have more laws limiting what they're able to do and what they're able to say. Um, but it still can be an issue with them. And the other lender that I would caution people about is National Collegiate Trust because they talk a big game and they also will back it up, unlike uh, Navient in many cases. So um, I've seen a lot of instances with National Collegiate Trust where they will push for a 75 or 80 percent settlement for months and months and months and then there's a brief window in between when they send it to a collection attorney in the client state, in the borrower state, and when it's still with them where they're going to authorize a, a decent settlement, a 50 or 60 percent settlement. Once it goes to a collection attorney, they're not going to take less than 65 percent of the balance in most cases. They're going to try to push forward the lawsuit because they get default judgments and people don't, don't defend themselves. If they do hire an attorney to defend themselves, if they get someone to court, lower settlements are possible during that, that legal process. And then once the judgment is obtained, if a judgment is obtained, lower settlements are possible then. But they're really coming forward hard with a blitz of collection activity up until about the 12th to 14th month after non-payment, which is when they will try to take a borrower to court. So National Collegiate Trust is not a lender that most people have, have ever picked to be their lender. Um, they are a lender that bought up a lot of these smaller private loans uh, as the market has, has gotten consolidated, as you mentioned earlier, in the last five to ten years. So they're one of the big players now, and it's, it is an actual trust. It's not a company. The company is known as Goal Structured Solutions, which not a lot of people know about. They're based out in uh, California. That's who owns the National Collegiate Trust. And most people think that um, AES is their private loan lender if they have a National Collegiate Trust account. That's who National Collegiate Trust uh, works with to service the loans. So you will never actually deal with 
NCT directly. It's going to be either AES, if it's current, or one of the collectors like Transworld Systems uh, incorporated after it, it goes into default. Weldman, Weinberg, and Reese collects on a lot of NCT debt. Um, they collect. Yeah. They they do a lot of collection for Navi and private loans. I saw you on the on the CRN site actually. Thank you for, for all your uh, commitment to answering reader questions on the website too. Um, sure. And you talked about Weltman, um, and I've always found them you know somewhat reasonable. Um, so I'm hearing the message, and I'm hearing it pretty clear. Uh, and hopefully viewers are hearing it as well. Is is that Get involved in your own solution and you know, stay aware, stay prepared, open all mail. Don't ignore things. Just because you don't have a financial solution or the wherewithal doesn't mean that you shouldn't be aware of what's happening with your student loans, as especially as they go into default or if you're dealing with National Collegiate Trust because you know, sometimes, um, especially with federal loans, because we have the income, income contingent plans, don't ignore the situation. So listen, Andrew, you help people. You help people a lot. You your focus now is you know working with people directly and bringing them on as customers and clients for private student loans. But you help a ton of people online with their federal stuff too. And people yeah. are able to engage obviously anywhere on any of the videos on the Debt Bytes YouTube channel. Um, and you're committed to responding to people if they post in the comments here at the, at, underneath this video. So they've got an opportunity to interact with you. What people may not know is on the hotline. I've got a hotline on our video. It's free. Everybody connected to that hotline. Is free to talk with you know to have an initial consultation and you're available there they can press 4 and get connected with you talk with you about their situation with a focus on private student loans um, you have a great ebook that you published it's very concise it's not too it's not gonna take anybody too long to read to really contemplate their options with their student loans both private and federal was that fun to put together? Um, are you doing updates? Do you have any planned updates? What's going on with that? Yeah, it was something that I put together uh, really over several years and uh, first published, I believe, in 2014. I just saw there really was not a concise, as you mentioned, source of information for people to really get a starting point on their federal student loans. And it's when I started noticing a lot of these debt relief companies popping up that were using very, very deceptive tactics. I feel like if someone just read the ebook, they're going to be you know, hopefully immune to that, that kind of um, deceptive marketing strategy because it gives them their options right there and lets them know the two main ways to get out of default and you know how to compare those two and see what's best for their situation. And it goes over um, just federal loans in general. We are going to be doing an update this year with that and kind of revamping it. And there have been some changes in the federal loan system recently. The new repay plan, as we discussed, the change from the um, uh, FAFSA PIN to the FSA ID. That's a, a big change. And also some changes with the way servicers um, process applications versus the direct consolidation department, which you know no longer handles direct consolidation applications. It all goes to the loan servicers now. So we will be updating that uh, probably within the next several months, so keep an eye out uh, for any new changes there. But yeah, it really is just a, a tool for people to get a starting point with their federal student loans. And hopefully on my website, I've, I've created a, um, uh, resources where people can really read through those and if, if they don't have a super complex federal loan issue, they should be able to figure it out on their own uh, through the different steps. I even have posted some of the applications on that website right, on the federal loan section. So we're not doing federal loan counseling that much anymore. Um, you know, I, I did it for quite a while and I really just prefer negotiating and I know there's not a lot of people that are specializing in private student loans. So that's one of the reasons I made that kind of my, my niche for now, uh, something that I, I really enjoy doing as well. But there are some other legitimate federal loan experts out there. There's not that many, but there are some other ones. So um, we can also connect you with them as well if I'm not able to help you directly. But um, a lot of the resources on the website are going to help you get through your federal loan issues on your own. And the ebook is definitely a good place to start for that. Awesome. Cool. Um, yeah, and you've been helping out. I think I'm going to publish your first post on the CRN site which is really cool. So thanks again for, I mean, your sincerity in wanting to help people is, it's unquestionable. And that's what attracted me to you in the first place. So um, I'm gonna be doing an interview uh, or another video similar to this on student loans, but the focus near the entire focus is going to be on borrower defense, which is um, not new per se, but it's new to most people because only three people ever applied for it, or at least three out of five. Five people applied for it, three people were actually granted uh, loan forgiveness due to this little known little nugget in the 90s that uh, the Congress put through 
on how to get your loans forgiven if you meet a very certain uh, near unfair and deceptive act and practices type of criteria at a state level. I'll be talking with Steve Rode, a good friend of mine, on that one, um, and I hope to be able to do that in the next week or two. So, uh, folks, if you're watching the video and you want to subscribe and you're dealing with student loan issues, we're going to have some more student loan types of content come out, uh, especially with credit reporting and different things like that. So uh, stay tuned. Thanks for tuning in to this video. And Andrew, thank you so much for being here and for the participation both in the comments going forward and for the help that you give people on the CRN website. Thanks much. Yeah, thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it too. Awesome.